This week, we welcome back the one and the only Marcus Ranum. Our technical segment will talk about a fight between Odroid and a Raspberry Pi 3. Joff and I and the rest of the gang will talk about the benefits and pros and cons of each platform for all of your hardware hacking, security-related needs. And our stories of the week are going to be absolutely epic. I found some fantastic stories about jumping air gaps, um, network management systems, and networking gear, two separate stories that are vulnerable, uh, and use of the term cyber hygiene will be discussed. All that and more, so stay tuned. This is a Security Weekly production. Broadcasting live from G-Unit Studios in Rhode Island, it's the show where exploits run wild, packets aren't the only things getting sniffed, and the cocktails flow steady. It's Paul's Security Weekly. Weekly is brought to you by the SANS Institute, the most trusted source for computer security training, certification, and research. Visit SANS.org to explore the full curriculum and latest training offerings. Onapsys, the leading provider of solutions to protect ERP systems from cyber attacks. Customers can secure their SAP and Oracle business critical platforms from espionage, sabotage, and financial fraud risks. Visit them on the web at onapsys.com. Pony Express. Check out their line of penetration testing devices, including the Pwn Pad, the Pwn Phone, and the Pwn Pro. For enterprises, there's Pwn Pulse, providing continuous visibility into wired, Wi-Fi, and Bluetooth spectrums across all physical locations, including remote sites and branch offices. For all those hard-to-reach places, there's Pony Express. Visit them on the web at PonyExpress.com. Hi, there you are. Didn't see hey. you. Didn't see you. Hey, uh, welcome to the show. I want to hey. introduce you to our uh, host. He's a man uh, who has a cyber hygiene policy that involves rubbing capsaicin oil on his wiener. Paul has a story. Welcome, everyone, to Security Weekly. I'm, of course, your host, Paul Asnorian, joined here in studio <laughs> by none other than Mr. Larry Pesci. Oh, sorry, Larry. I, had had, oh, I, I, got, I got stuck. I'm like, what am I going to say? And I'm yeah. like, oh, I need a minute. So, oh, hi. <laughs> I'm, and I, I'm really uh, anxious to talk about the story that we have about the, uh, the air gap jumping mm -hmm. story, the USB mm -hmm. thing. That's going to be a lot of fun. Uh, um, yes. Mr. Jack Daniels here in studio. Jack, what? welcome to what? the show. Hey, hey, hey. good, going good on, Jack? to finally be back in the studio with you. Yes, yeah, nice to have you. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. On the lines via Skype, Mr. Joff Fire is here. Good evening, everybody. It's great to be here again. Great to see a full house tonight. Yes. I love that. Nice shirt. Yeah, and, uh, thank you. Also <laughs> on the lines, I couldn't see who it was, it's Mr. Carlos Perez is with us. Carlos, welcome. Hey, happy to be here. Yes, just a couple of quick announcements before we get into our feature interview for the show, securityweekly.com forward slash hot seat. The latest edition of the Enterprise Security Hot Seat is happening September 13th. Register today where Pony Express product manager Yolanda Smith will step into the hot seat. She'll be here in studio. And she gets to answer 10 tough questions about Pony Express products. If you'd like to join in the audience, I also... Uh, relay audience questions, and you can uh, pretty much ask whatever you like within reason. Actually, right, within right, reason, yes. I, I like to be fair to audience and the guest as well. Um, mm -hmm, so, mm -hmm. I mean, some people have asked very pointed questions about the products uh, on that on this webcast. So uh, it's That's been going really well. <laughs> we're gonna, yeah, we're gonna do more of them, and I think it's a it's a good opportunity for people to, um, you know, showcase uh, how their products fit in the market and be able to kind of uh, almost defend them in a, in a public forum, uh, which is awesome. Make sure you visit securityweekly.com forward slash subscribe. You can subscribe to every single one of our shows individually or get the main feed. There'll be some more news as we make a few more adjustments in the rotation moving into 2017. Um, securityweekly.com forward slash subscribe. I did add the Paul's Security Weekly only feed. So mm -hmm. if you want to subscribe to all the shows individually, 
you can do, do that. So. It was there. The problem is it wasn't in iTunes or Google Play. So uh, now, it, now it is, so it's easier gotcha. to find. Um, Marcus Ranum comes back on the show for this episode. We're very excited to have Marcus on to talk about all kinds of topics, including making soap, which we'll reserve for the end. Marcus, welcome back to Security Weekly. Hey, good to be here. Um, so, Marcus, uh, in uh, past interviews and in presentations, you know, you've uh, given talks on cyber war. Uh, and given the events over the past several years with state-sponsored hacking, how have your views on cyber war been impacted? They haven't changed particularly much. I think that the you know things have played out pretty much as I predicted. The big scenario of some nation being knocked back to the Stone Age by cyber attack that hasn't materialized, and it doesn't show much of a sign of being likely to materialize. Um, the 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 big thing that kind of depresses me that I called out is that I was afraid that the U.S. was going to turn cyber war into a weapon of privilege, which is you know something we can use on you, but don't you dare even think about using on us. Mm -hmm. And that that appears to be the U.S.'s strategy. Our our home security still appears to be pathetically weak in a lot of situations, um, yet the Department of uh, Stone Throwing from its uh, comfortable glass offices is uh, developing offensive capabilities and seems to be pretty unrestrained about deploying them. Yeah, it's interesting, Marcus. Um, I, I can't help but think of the documentary film uh, Zero Day, uh, which spoke a lot about this particular topic. They mentioned that zero it, days. Zero right? days. Okay. Thank you. Good. Good. Just um, making sure. I'm making, making they, sure. I'm like shit. I'm missing another one. They, they <laughs> mentioned that in response to Stuxnet, that there were a couple of attacks. I believe on the banking and the financial industry that were a direct retaliation uh, from Iran for Stuxnet. Um, is that the kind of thing that still, even though they attacked our banking system, that there still hasn't been a catastrophic cyber attack like that that like puts, as Jack was telling me earlier, puts people on the ground? Yeah, I don't think any, I don't think any of it's been catastrophic yet. Um, I'm sure eventually somebody sooner or later will screw things up in a pretty bad way and wind up causing a tremendous amount of damage. And you got to remember, Stuxnet didn't just take out uh, some centrifuges at Natanz; it also screwed up the mm -hmm. breeder reactor at Bashir, which is a city of several hundred thousand people. So that was a, a violation of some terms of the Geneva Conventions uh, regarding, um, you know, dangerous natural phenomena, including well um, um, dams and nuclear power reactors. So at the very least, you know, there was a potential there for, you know, well, what would have happened if the uh, coolant pump systems had accidentally gone offline during the, during the course of the attack? Do you, do you think it's we're in this kind of arms race in this standoff, you know, back in the days of the nuclear war where we're, we just have the weapons pointed at each other and no one wants to make the first move to make something catastrophic happen? I mean, certainly it's not capabilities from, from what the rumors that I hear is that everyone's in everyone else's critical infrastructure systems. Well, that's that's there's an important thing to consider about that, which is during the Cold War, the there were very rational although kind of scarily rational, people involved in establishing doctrines of mm -hmm. mutual assured destruction, and they, they ratcheted the situation into that balanced posture very slowly and very carefully. Um, I'm not seeing that happening with the cyber stuff. I'm mm -hmm. seeing it just being deployed willy-nilly. Well, we've got it. We may as well feel it. Let's see what happens kind of, kind of an environment. Um, I think, you know, the, 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 the U.S. as the, probably the world's foremost deployer of cyber weaponry right now, uh, the U.S. is not acting very judiciously. And, uh, you know, blowback's a bitch. And I, mm -hmm. I think that's going hap to happen eventually. And, you know, when that happens, what, what, what is the response? I mean, we could say it's an act of war if we come under a cyber attack, except that we've just been committing those acts of war all over the place already anyway. So, you know, have we... Have we uh, if you want to look at it that way, have we given the Iranians carte blanche to launch a drone strike against uh, against the national security headquarters? Um, it's an act of war. Uh, you know, this is this is tricky. And and the problem I have with this whole scenario is I don't think that the the people in the policymakers are anywhere near intelligent enough to balance this correctly and they're they're not doing their homework they're they're listening to their advisors and their advisors are usually saying things like uh, well let's just try it and see what it does to those guys mm. oh. 
<laughs> does it does it fall on the the public sector to make sure that we are considering uh, attacks from targeted attacks from other nation states that aren't so friendly to us uh, in our defenses? And how often do you see that when you speak with companies? We have to, and we should. Uh, the companies that I've talked to in the energy sector and some of those, I think they've got a you know, they've got an understanding of the severity of the potential damage that they could suffer. Um, whether they're doing the right things or not is another really <laughs> interesting question. Um, you know, and, and, and that's what I mean about the Department of Stone Throwing, you know, developing technology from its glass offices. We've got, you know, we've got extreme disparities in our own internal skill sets. Uh, from the government side, I think the private sector in a lot of cases is doing a fairly effective job of risk management. The problem is you can't do an effective job of risk management when your own government is perturbing the situation by going about and, and launching potentially provocative attacks. And in that mm -hmm. situation, you know, that could apply to the Chinese who are, who are allegedly doing all the bad cyber stuff. Excuse me, is it the North Koreans this week or is it the Chinese or the... Ru I forget who it is this week, but... It's the, you know, the Russians trying to disrupt our election, right? That's the, the dollar, latest thing. Dollar evil foe. Yeah. Um, <laughs> you know, I don't think dollar evil foe can actually do as much damage to us from a cyber perspective as over relying on expensive beltway bandit contractors has done. Mm. <laughs> nope. I, yep. I mean, the old, the old joke I used to say was, you know, how do you crash the U.S. energy grid? Well, Enron tried. Mm -hmm. <laughs> well, this is true. Wow. Yeah. Um, it, it, is it? More so that we're relying on the so-called cyber efforts to uh, not so much for disruption, although obviously we've seen cases of that, but is it more falling in that we're not in so much of a cyber war as it's more just like espionage and spying more so than sabotage and disruption? I think there's a tremendous amount of that. There should be, there should be a tremendous amount of that. You know, now, now I'm going to say something a little bit odd, I think, which is, you know, as a kind of a, a hippie peacenik type, I actually believe that in democracies that intelligence should be open. And so I actually think espionage is a good thing because what espionage tends to do is level the military technology playing field to the point where you don't have uh, the ability for a superpower to arise. So I actually think one of the probably one of the best things that happened in the war, uh, the Second World War, was that the uh, the Russians were able to correctly exfiltrate information about nuclear technology. Otherwise, we would have the U.S. running around using nukes all over the place. Um, yeah, it kind of it. it blows away the theory that more it's more top secret about how we got the information than the information itself although in that situation the information itself was pretty damn important right yeah well as as richard Feynman said the only real secret about nuclear weapons was that 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 they worked um, every, every, <laughs> once you've done that everything else pretty much follows it's just a matter of engineering and physics and I, th I think that's really an issue with with all of this stuff same thing with cyber weapons you know i mean the only secret about cyber weapons is they work well mm -hmm. well duh right, you know right. that, that none of that is none of that is rocket science either um i i think i gave a talk probably about five or six years ago at a conference in europe when i said you know if you guys are serious about this you need to develop your own operating system and make sure that your coding practices are such that, that American coders don't have a hand in it. And everybody kind of looked at me like I was talking crazy stuff. Oh, you know, I'm, I'm used to that. <laughs> but, <laughs> but, but I mean, that, that really is the kind of issue that we're up against. And, uh, you know, I think, you know, honestly, I, Given the amount of money that's at stake, as well as the technological leverage that's ex at stake, I am quite surprised that, for example, China hasn't developed its own operating system um, and its own operating environment, its own app store model. I mean, imagine, imagine what would happen if a government that was interested in keeping tabs on its people while keeping another government out produce something that looked kind of like the Apple environment that was a tamper-proof, uh, mm. semi-tamper-proof runtime environment and made that an agency-wide requirement. That would instantly leapfrog them as being vastly superior in terms of cyber defense to, to everything that the U.S. and all of its civilian agencies are doing. 
Are, okay. I mean, that, that kind of begs the question if there are programmers in the world that can develop software that securely. Well, sure. Operating systems are just operating systems. It's just code. It doesn't need to be that complex. Um, you know, back in, I think it was 2001 or 2002, I was on the senior industry review group for the National Security Agency regarding the global infrastructure grid. And it was me and David Ockschmidt and, uh, and Marianne Davidson from Oracle and, some, and uh, P, uh, Steve Kent and some other, some other people who were a lot smarter than I was. And uh, anyway, this kind of dinner party that happened afterwards, I managed to take aside one of the senior people who was responsible for the entire program. And I dropped this suggestion, which I had, which is since the, the intelligence community's doctrine at the time was we're going to go to browser enabled everything. Why don't you guys develop a minimized secure browser that runs on a platform like a PlayStation? And in those days, it was a PlayStation Two. Mm -hmm. Why don't you make something that boots into, you know, make something that boots into a secure environment from tamper-proof media, and then deliver everything through a browser using your own encryption? And, and you know, the guy just kind of recoiled from me like I had suggested something utterly horrifying. And then he said something I thought was quite profound, which is, you know, we would have so many lobbyists from Microsoft here in in that hours. <clears throat> Yeah. yeah, interesting. Hey, Marcus, ahead, uh, in the the whole cyber war thing, one of the the things that I think is interesting about the Russians is that um, I don't think they always have a, an actual end goal other than sowing confusion. Or um, you know, they, they seem to be one of those people that understands at a, at a nation state level some of the fundamentals of um, being in control of a situation, which is if, if your opponent is not in control or is uncomfortable or feels awkward. Like, what what the hell are the Russians doing now? And what is their end game? And it doesn't matter, I think, in some cases, what their end game is. Um, yeah, so like they just want to yeah. change perception with propaganda. Right, like, so is, yeah. is, is putting a little bit of doubt in the electoral system enough to deteriorate faith in the whole electoral system, no matter who wins? You know, um, what are your thoughts well, on that? I've heard some people, you know, do that. Obviously, some things are specific targets, but other things seem to be a little random, and that kind of works with with the idea of just keeping your enemy uncomfortable is a good place to be. What are your thoughts? Well, I, th I, I think that's where where <coughs> things always work. I think the Russians actually have fairly consistently had a disciplined approach towards intelligence, which is that they try to they try to keep enough of their antenna out there so that they have a good chance of learning about something that's going to impact <coughs> them before it actually happens. You know, that that's 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 pretty good. I think, you know, American intelligence actually hasn't done a very good job of that, right? You know, the CIA was asleep at the switch when the Soviet Union collapsed, they kind of went, oh, big surprise. Um, the Russians wouldn't f the Russians wouldn't make a mistake like that because their their doctrines have been fairly consistently to be in places where they can where they can collect information and analyze and understand and assess. And then usually when you're talking about the results of intelligence at that level, um, the responses are almost always going to be political um, rather than you know, I'm not going to, I'm not going to drop your power grid for a day. I'm going to, I'm going to make completely make your Syria policy look utterly ridiculous or throw your election into doubt. Although, you know, from that standpoint, back to my earlier comment about, about Enron, how, how could the Russians possibly make our electoral system <laughs> right. look any, any <laughs> sillier? <laughs> we, in we, fact, uh, in fact, we don't in need fact, their I, help. Yeah. <laughs> I must, I must make an important point about that. The, the, <clears throat> Theoretical involvement of the Russians in our electoral system is actually being used by the parties as yep. an excuse for what a bunch of clowns they are. Yep. They're saying, we are clowns because the Russians are making us look like clowns. I'm actually not willing to give the Russians that much credit. I don't think that the Russians <laughs> have good. sufficient clown technology to produce a Donald Trump. They, they, they do have, um, yeah, we, we, do, we still have the market cornered on... Political on clown on political it, it, crown. <laughs> although There's, although I've got to admit to you know with with apologies to my friends in Britain you guys are making a serious <laughs> effort. <laughs> They, they did make yes. a good play. Actually. A for effort. A Jeez. for effort. There was, know. there was a clown gap, but the British somehow managed to produce Farage from someplace. Yes, yes. Right. Yes. 
It was like the, the, one of the first images in our Slack channel we created today <laughs> was Putin. He was you, Larry. Putin with... No, you did. Putin, uh, Putin with on the horse with Donald Trump riding mm-hmm. shotgun yep. on the horse. <laughs> yeah. Just, yeah. I, I did cream... I, I put creamed corn. You creamed, and, and yeah, there's a lot of... There's... Mm, it's just... I, um, I, go ahead, I Mark. Do think it, I do think it's important, though, to realize that, you know, we all operate in an intensely propagandized environment, and the governments of the world, all of them, have seen the Internet for what it is. It's a place to, it's a place to get their message out, and, exactly. you know, so, so it's important. It's important to look at these kinds of effects where people are talking about manipulating the elections. I do think that's fascinating. You know, for, 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 I do not support this effort, but um, it appears to me that WikiLeaks, in 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 the form of Julian Assange, but it appears to me that WikiLeaks does not like Hillary Clinton and is specifically doing things to attempt to influence the U.S. election. Um, that's, that, that's interesting. Um, I, you know, it's, it shows maybe that nerds have achieved a type of power that normally was reserved only for oligarchs like the Koch brothers. So, so, you know, that's, that's something to think about. Hmm. Well, you know, um, but there was the McAfee for president thing and, and, uh, uh, he apparently did not get as much traction as he would have liked. So, that was tempered a little, in my opinion, because, well, I would like to see McAfee get some more traction. Well, after Trump, I think McAfee will be a shoe in for the next Republican nominee. <laughs> <laughs> a- a- absolutely. <laughs> but we got to suffer through the next few years. <laughs> Oh boy! Uh, so transitioning from the political arena, <laughs> it's, um, compelling security metrics, Marcus, uh, seem to be out of reach for so many people <laughs> in security as uh, security professionals. No puedo, no puedo. What? No puedo. What if no I? Pu- <laughs> I, would, I would agree, Carlos. Is Carlos okay? I hope so. Um, so, what advice do you have for people today that are looking for good? security metrics and I guess that also begs the question what is a good security metric okay right a good security metric is a st- is a metric that tells a story uh, it's it's a it's a bunch of data and a way of reducing that data into some kind of usually a, a visual aid that tells some kind of a story and that story has to have uh, a story arc to it which is usually going to be something like you know in the beginning there was a little company that had a that had you know software controlled processes and then they realized that their entire production line was controlled by software and then they had software problems and it cost them this amount and here's some things we could do to keep that from happening just made that up a, as an example but but you know a good metric what you're going to do is you're going to you're going to take something about the organization's experience and reduce it down into a way of quantifying it in some way that makes sense. And frequently when I'm talking about metrics, somebody will come up to me and you know go, well, what are the, the, the 10 metrics you think every organization Ooh. should keep? Yep. That is an absolute betrayal of a complete failure to understand the point, which is that the, the metrics are going to only be relevant to your particular organization, to your business practices, to your understanding of what it is that you're what it is that you're trying to accomplish. And so, what I usually tell people who are who are concerned with this is, you know, I get a little bit. I do my whole little Zen routine, and I say, you know, what is the best time to plant a mighty oak tree? Well, it's 50 years ago. Um, the second the second best time to plant a mighty oak tree is is right now, and a lot of the benefits that you can get from having a metrics program, you're not even going to see them until after your first year. Because what you want to start doing is collecting some information about something and then see if that information is consistent. See if, you know, let's say, let's say we, we collect for a year broken down into multiple buckets by operating system, by business unit, by root cause. We collect information about security incidents in a large organization. At the end of a year, I'm going to actually have something that I can make some kind of an interesting comment about. The best I have no the, idea. Marcus, the best example you gave of that is in an article that you wrote. And you said you had a friend that worked for a university, and, and I worked for a university doing security for seven years, so really resonated with me. He said, you know, he um, took a poll of all the different departments that managed all their own systems and (coughs) monitored their security breaches and then compared that to the breaches that were experienced by central IT organization controlled systems and basically had a bar chart 
And the department controlled systems were like way up here, lots of compromises, and the IT controlled systems were way down here. Very, very simple metric, but it speaks volumes. Right. And that's, that's really a matter of just correctly bucketing your data as you're collecting it. Uh, right. So he collected, he collected, uh, that was uh, Columbia University, Joel Rosenblatt. Was okay. Doing yeah. This. Yeah. He's so done he awesome collected, metrics work. Yep. Yeah. He, he collected this stuff um, from their incident practice and, and from vulnerability scans and a bunch of other sources and synthesized it all together. Um, and he presented, he presented the managed versus unmanaged statistic. And then he also presented the operating system statistic. So, Mm -hmm. you know, Hey, it turns out that windows XP really is not as good as windows 10 from a security (laughs) perspective. I, you know, okay, that, that's a really interesting thing. Right. And then you can also come up with other inferences, which he would, he wouldn't bother doing, which is, you know, it turns out that apparently somebody who's less of an IT expert can actually do a not terrible job running. Running Windows 10 compared to somebody who's not an IT expert trying to run a secure version of Windows uh, XP. You know, so you can learn those kinds of things. You know, another person who's doing great work in this field is Jay Jacobs, who did the did all the Veris stuff and the Verizon uh, DBIR for for a number of years, and he's doing some fun stuff with metrics as well. Um, but you know, I. I I just tell people, you know, you start collecting things and then think about the different ways that you're going to slice the information you're going to collect. And the obvious thing you want to collect is whatever you've got. So you start with whatever your process is. If you're if you're the head of incident response for your organization, here's a good place to start metrics. Measure things about your incident response process. How often do you run it? How many hours does it take? Clock time? How many hours does it take? Staff time? Um, what are the consequences? What are the root causes? What are the, the frequent outputs? What are the inputs? So, so you, you know, what I always tell people to measure is you want to measure inputs, outputs, and then clock time and level of effort. Mark, just start with that. One of the metrics that I, I sometimes hesitate to recommend, but I, I think it's really uh, uh, kind of compelling and effective. I want to get your take on it. And it, there's a certain level of shaming that can occur when you have metrics. So let's say you're in a, a staff meeting, you're the security person, and there's the, you know, the heads of all the different uh, departments and networks and sysadmin departments. And you can do this with vulnerabilities or incidents. And you show that this group has 50% more vulnerabilities and or incidents than this other group. And you're recommending to managers or C-levels that they need more help. And maybe that's the group that says, well, you know, we don't care about the security thing. That's your problem. Is that kind of level of shaming, is that effective? Or I I imagine it depends on the organization, right? Sure. It's 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 tremendously effective, and I don't think that necessarily it's it's not necessarily shaming. There's a lot of things that you have to understand when you try to dig into that kind of metric. It could be that that business unit A has got five times the breaches of business unit B, but it also could be that business unit B is the server farm, and when they have a breach, it's hellacious. And when business unit A has a breach, they're able to right. handle it very effectively. So you really have to think about how you're going to slice these buckets. I will tell you. I will tell you that nastiest metric that I've ever recommended to anyone to keep. I was talking to some folks and they were uh, they were having a, um, uh, what's the best way to put this? Uh, Gen- Am I allowed to use slightly off-color yes, language? Yes, absolutely. Uh, they were having a uh, they were having a an extremely nasty pissing contest with mm-hmm. their uh, with their IT department, and so what I suggested that they do is they bucket their they bucket their incident data as. But being tied to a root cause analysis, ideally to something like a CVE, and then they track when they noti- when they notified the um, configuration management team about the patch related to a particular CVE. So the metric was the "I told you so" metric, right? <laughs> Um, and and that is incredibly powerful. And you don't. And again, it depends on how you want to tell the story. You don't have to do that from a standpoint of shaming. But when you go to the executive team and you say, "Well, we had, you know, I'm just making numbers up here, right? We had 150 incidents last year. Of those 150 incidents, a hundred of them were related to things that we had actually notified the configuration mm-hmm. management practice that they should right. have fixed." Um, and the remaining 50 were, you know, day zeros and uh, of, or day zeros and uh, phishing attacks. And of the phishing attacks were 90% of the rest. And and management will do the rest from there, right? Mm-hmm. They'll they'll just 
they'll just take it away. You don't have to point the finger. You just simply say, here's some data. I guess another way of putting it would be that, you know, some metrics, when they're they're particularly hostile or potentially shaming, you don't actually have to tell the entire story. You can kind of mm-hmm. you can kind of imply this you can imply the story and allow uh, allow management to tell the rest of the story themselves as they read it. And that's a struggle that, that so many of us have in security is communicating with teams and telling them they need to patch something. And often the feedback I hear from security professionals is, well, you know, they can't patch it or they won't patch it or they want 90 days or six months to patch it. And, and how do I improve upon that process? And that's a, a severely loaded question. So I'll, I'll give you some great advice on that that I've given to a couple of people um, it, it's it's kind of silly, but if you're if you're in an organization with a reasonable budget, um, whatever vendor it is that you're using for configuration management, bring that vendor in. If it's Microsoft with SCCM or mm-hmm. ConfigureSoft or whoever it is you're using, bring that vendor's professional services team in on a limited three-day engagement to do a. Uh, a set of training for your security team, your your vulnerability management team, and your configuration management team together about how to use their CM tool in order to improve and speed up your VM process. Mm-hmm. Because one of the things that will happen is when your VM team comes to learn what things the CM tools can do and can't do effectively and can't do effectively, they're going to understand in the situations where the CM team says, no, we really can't push that patch to those machines um, you know, on, on that particular schedule. There will be some sympathy and understanding there. Um, but the, the, the flip side goes the other way where, you know, if the, if the CM teams are going, no, that patch can't be installed, it's going to be really hard. Then someone from the VM team can say, well, why don't you stand away from the console? Cause I can do it. In fi- I can do it in five minutes. Mm-hmm. If you can't, if you can't afford to do the cross training, another thing that's really important to do is go, go on Amazon and buy, um, last year's copy of SCCM for dummies or whatever, it'll cost you, you know, five cents or 10 cents for the previous version and simply make yourself familiar with the capabilities of the tool. I was involved in a security incident response a number of years ago and uh, the people doing the first response were were actually getting ready to go buy a large number of external um, uh, uh USB drives so that they could do operating system reloads on these these bricked machines and I said well why don't you just do a greenfield install boot from SCCM that's a that's a feature of the product you do a, you do a mm-hmm. BIOS boot over the network and then you have it install Windows and they all kind of went Die. You can, you can do that I mean you know one of the big problems and so so here's here's kind of the the you're not tall enough to ride this ride if you can't if you can't ride here if your organization's idea of configuration management is that they use SCCM to do the basic install of Windows and then they hand it to the user and say here it's yours screw it up now <laughs> um, y- you are going to lose your job to the cloud guys because yep. the cloud guys the cloud guys understand that this is a game about systems administration and configuration management and if you suck at it you're going to be unemployed in a not too distant future yep i completely agree mm-hmm. um transitioning to yet another topic um i thought it was interesting marcus and we've had similar conversations here uh, on security weekly in fact uh, last week or the week before we talked about hacker jeopardy uh, in, in some of the uh, kind of controversy that that brought and our mm-hmm. opinions on mm-hmm. that. Um, what prompted your decision not to speak at conferences that don't have an anti-harassment policy? Ah, okay. Um, you know, so so let's see. We've got how many how many bearded white guy aging bearded white yeah. guys here talking <laughs> yes. about sexual harassment? That, uh, <laughs> do, do I actually need to? What I can't even remember whose law it is, but somebody or other somebody or other's law is that that even talking about feminism almost always justifies feminism, which mm-hmm. is mm-hmm. you know which is true. I mean, but 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 seriously, um, the real reason I got into this was because. I, I exist across several communities. I exist among the software developers. I exist among the gamers. I exist among the atheo skeptic community. I exist among a, a variety of communi- communities and uh, the photography community as well. In every community that I have been involved, there have been big problems with 
skeevy people at conferences who are mm-hmm. not respecting other people's limits. Um, and, you know, it's the same issue at at computer security conferences. Now, it's gotten a little bit better. You, you may remember I did an article a couple of years ago uh, where Gary McGraw and I went and interviewed Booth Babes at RSA conference, just try, in, you know, and, and RSA conference has kind of dialed down on the Booth Babes. Mm-hmm. But, you know, what does that tell uh, the customer base if the customer base is actually the female CTO of a hospital or something like that, uh, having having booth babes? And so there's, there's, a, there's a lot of issues. First off, it promotes that boys club mentality, and I think that boys club mentality causes people to make certain unwise decisions when they're drunk. Um, it's disrespectful of customers experiences and it's just it's bad marketing it shows that that there's some people who fundamentally just don't get it about how do you how do you get on the side of your customer and understand your customers problems i mean if if you want to put it this way if you're a computer security company and the way that you're selling your products is by having young women in fishnets draped over the ceo's ferrari that doesn't show you understand how to build a great firewall Right. And, you know, I used to go to RSA and, you know, the booth that was always packed was if you went over to Palo Alto and near Zhuk, the founder and kind of chief architect of their product set, was standing there taking taking questions. And, you know, people wanted to hear what he had to say. Mm-hmm. And he wasn't even wearing fishnets and platform heels. So I or think so we're sitting in a, or sitting in a Ferrari. <laughs> yeah. You know, and, you know, I've, well, that's <clears throat> another one that I totally don't understand. I mean, what kind of marketing idiot is going to go, I know, let's show everybody that our CEO has this really nice car that he bought as a tax write off so that he could bring to these conferences and rub in your face how great he's got it thanks to your security problems. That, that's just genius marketing right there. Um, you know, your your suckage bought me this Ferrari. Thank you. Um, I, I, I don't get that. Now, if you if you you know to to the point of John McAfee. Now, if you put John McAfee in a dunking booth and let people come by and throw baseballs to try to knock him into the water or something, then you'd have a line all the way around the Moscone Center. <laughs> Uh, hear, hear that, you know, John? Hear that, John? <laughs> and you know, and I used to, I used to threaten this, and it's part of how I got out of having to do booth duty. But I used to threaten to show up at the Tenable booth wearing a mini skirt, fishnets, and stripper heels, and everybody would just go, ah. "Man, I wish you'd but, done." That's it. not a visual that I, I needed, Marcus. But, but but here's but here's the issue. If that's appropriate, then that's appropriate. If that's the way, if that's the kind of industry we want to be, that's the kind of industry we are. And and I really think we, you know, we, we can kind of grow up a little bit past that. Um, yeah, uh, unfortunately, what 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 really bothers me is we appear to be growing from from the boys' club directly to this paramilitary thing which really also bothers Ooh. me a lot so it's we're going from we're going from bad to worse and yeah and, and that's what concerns me i i agree with your stance <clears throat> on the sexual harassment policies i absolutely believe it should be in every conference's policies and they should be monitoring it and uh training their staff and in others in during the conference uh about it um i do agree with your statement marcus that you know us having the hack naked logo certainly I think people take that political correctness to a whole new level. Um, we get some interesting it's, feedback about hacker jeopardy. Uh, you it's know. not. It's not. It's not political correctness. It's actually. It's actually sending a message to. It's sending a message to women hackers that that's the way we see you. And I think you should change your logo, but it's not my business. I mean, you're not as bad as the Washington Redskins, but come on, it's so, it's 2016. So we did, we did uh, extend our logo so that there is a version with a naked man as well. Oh, oh good. So, so yeah. <laughs> that, that, yeah. So, so the equal opportunity harassment, I think, is a good way to solve the problem, actually. Um, if you want to continue um, behaving in that, in that way, then, hey, okay, then bring it all out. Right well, or eliminate it all, but don't don't be one sided. And, and you know the other thing I, that comes to mind in my in, in my head with this is everybody I know in the industry says we says we need to attract more women to the industry. We'd like to even have the playing field. Well, basically having a hostile environment is not a way to attract more women into the I, industry. 
I, I, you know, that's one of the other things I totally don't understand. You go to DAFCON, and um, and people, you know, people will say, "Boy, I wish there were more girls in the hacking community. I, <laughs> I wish it wasn't just us all, all of us sweaty white guys." Um, well, I can tell you why there aren't girls in the hacking community. It's because they don't feel welcome. They feel abused. They get they get groped. People get drunk. They say they say really stupid things. Yep. There have been sexual there have been sexual assaults at conferences. The conferences did not handle them well at all. <clears throat> and and one more point that I want to make is you know as a speaker, as somebody, if I'm the keynote speaker at a conference. I I have to be utterly hardcore about that. I mean, it's not like I attract groupies, but um, you know, you know, I'm an employee of the conference. I'm representing the conference. Yeah, I was just gonna say you I represent am, the conference at that point, Marcus. Yeah, right. I represent the conference. I represent myself, and I represent my the company that mm -hmm. I work for. So I'm representing me, Tenable, and that conference. And if I'm getting drunk in the hotel bar and macking on attendees. Regardless of their gender, mm -hmm. I am doing an incredibly stupid thing. Now, I have had experiences where people have said that they want to talk to me about certain things. It might be photography. It might be, you know, it might be anything that's really outside the scope of the conference. And my usual response is, you know, I would love to talk about that, but you have to understand, I'm working. This is my job right now. I'm I'm at work. And uh, if you want to talk about soap making or mold making or whatever, um, my email address is very easy to find, and I will bend your ear until hell freezes over, but not right now. Right now, I'll talk vulnerability management, key exchange, I'll talk uh, you know, secure software development, metrics, whatever it is you want, but it's about computer security, because that's what I was invited here to do. Good Speaking point. of that, Marcus, some of your talks at uh, the recent EINS events and upcoming EINS events, um, your talk title was No Quarter, The Ruthless Pursuit of Advanced Malware, but you also said there's some other topics uh, that you're discussing uh, in the EINS community as well. Yeah, so... so uh, um a couple of years ago, when, when Sony was having all of their big problems, um, I got involved in a project by some, some fairly visionary people who were trying to figure out how do we not be the next Sony. And so we, we were looking at essentially re-architecting an existing network, and we came up with it's it's nothing that's not a bunch of old school stuff that most of us have been te preaching about for a very long time. But we came up with some ideas around the way you can overlap and interlock controls so that one control back checks the behavior of another. Now, that is a, an old idea, but it's very effective. Um, uh, my friend Ron Dilley, who worked with me on that, Tom Liston was involved in that project as well. Um, we called it the, the doctrine of overcompensating controls. So, for example, you use, you use your firewall to enforce segmentation, but you also use your firewall to verify and act as a front-end edge alarm if people are doing administrative access not going through your privileged access management system. Right, so you might have you might carry a few extra rules in your firewall, but it, it kind of comes back to the same contact, uh, concept I was talking about um, regarding metrics. If you understand your business requirements, you understand how data should and should not flow in your networks. You use one control to generate you alerts if the other control is not working properly. This is really really important because one of the consistent complaints from security practitioners is. All of these controls that we have on our networks produce too much data. They produce too many alerts. So if you're following the doctrine of overcompensating controls, your first control, you might actually ignore the data, the, the alerts that come from that one, and you simply look at the alerts that come from the second one. So um, let, let me pick another, another example than the privileged access management one. Let's say you've got a runtime control. You're using AppLocker on desktops, and you're also using system configuration management, well, one of the things that you ought to be able to do is look at the variance logs in your CM database and see if people are being able to install and run their own applications even though they're not supposed to be able to. Because if you see that happening, you know you've detected a, a guaranteed 
policy violation as opposed to something that's just an anomaly. So, so I'm a big fan of, of that idea and I've been, I've been preaching it and, you know, usually people listen to me for a little while and, and one of two things happen. They either, they either smile and, and, and walk away and say, you're just talking the same old stuff you've been talking for 25 years. And I go, yeah. Um, <laughs> Or the other thing that they the other thing that they say is they say, well, that would be really hard, and yep, then yeah. I and then I walk away and I say, see you in the newspapers, bud. Mm. I'll see you in another yes. twenty five years when I'm telling you the same so, thing all over so, again. Um, I, I'd like to chime in on that, Marcus. First of all, I agree wholeheartedly, and I'm a big subscriber to the same idea. I used to be a big network design guy, chief architect, blah blah blah, whatever title I had. And the key is though with what you're talking about and why people say it's too hard and they shouldn't, by the way, is that that requires you to understand your environment very thoroughly and to actually architect and design around the understanding of your environment and your business requirements. And yep. that's what's not happening. Yep. And, and you're, you're exactly right. And I get, that, I get that all the time. I get that from very senior executives. I've, I've heard that from CTOs. Oh, but it would be hard. And I go, and I go what, what about not understanding your networking is, is sort of not the bailiwick of the chief technology officer? Marcus, is, 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 is that what you mean um, in your Eins bio? It said something about low rent security, do it yourself. Yeah, exactly. I mean, this is this is stuff that you're not really taught. Okay, so here's a place where I know you guys are going to all clutch your temples and go, "Oh boy, there goes Marcus again." Um, but again, 25 years I've been saying this. Actually, it's closer to 30 now. Come to think of it, but but you know, our industry right now is on a ramp that is focusing technology over people. The idea is you're going to buy a one U high device that ostensibly automates a complicated process. And my doctrine is that you don't buy that one U high rack mount device. What you do is you actually spend some time understanding what the heck it is that you're doing. I mean, I, I don't want to say, you know, back, back in my day when we had to carve our networks, we carved our ethernet out of rocks. Uh, but you know, back, Back in the day when you actually had to build your networks and think about routing and, and 200 and something hosts on a network, you, you know, you actually had to think about networks. A lot of networking nowadays is you buy a big box from Cisco and you plug wires in and then the thing on the port turns green, you have a network. It works. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and so here's the problem. All of these CTOs that I'm yelling at, they have this, they have this idea, which is we hire, we hire a person, we give them a salary, we hired them for a reason. We give them a computer, but we don't understand what we actually hired them to do, nor do we understand what that computer is supposed to be doing. Which, if you think about that, that's just really, really stupid. Um, and, but that's that's basically what's going on. And I've had I've had that from you know lots and lots of people where they go, well, we don't we don't track what happens to the machine after it leaves IT's hands once it's been provisioned. And I go, you know, you're an idiot because because when you're provisioning a machine, you've got all this information like what you know what business unit does it belong to, what is the perp what is the purpose of the system. You should be able to fingerprint that system and say, oh, Wally's a coder. Okay, Wally's, you know, Wally is probably going to be doing web browsing and email because everybody does web browsing, email, DNS requests, and a couple of things like that. Um, but Wally's probably going to be going to GitHub and in a couple of places, blah, blah, blah. Wally -E is not going to be uploading gigabytes and terabytes of MP4s, mm -hmm. right? So you can make those kinds of simple policy statements. And if you can make those simple policy statements, then you, you've got your doctrine for how you detect policy violations right there. The reason that people are having so much trouble saying what is normal on our network and what is a policy violation is because they don't know what's normal because they haven't put the effort in to figure out what their network actually mm -hmm. does. Exactly. If you know what your network, if you know what your network does, what you do is you measure everything that it's doing right now. You subtract everything from what it's doing right now that you know it's supposed to be doing, and then everything that's left over is your anomalies. Yep. No, I yeah, it's just it, I it, it's interesting. That. The benefit from that is not only do you get good security intelligence from that, but you also get operational intelligence uh -huh. too. Oh yeah. Uh, yeah some yeah, of the well, things we yeah. find with some of the, the products that we're working with is we find. Anomalies; those could be security-related, or they could be operational-related. Yeah. Yep. 
and and you know the the thing that's so strange to me is that a lot of organizations and I'm not I'm not throwing any rocks at any of the vendors who make the products in that space. I remember I I used to be the CEO and founder of an intrusion detection company, so I'm certainly not criticizing myself. I wouldn't do that. Mm-hmm. Uh, but you know the, the the idea is instead of trying to understand our network, define what is proper behavior, and then look for anomalies through subtraction, where we'd rather drop a one U high rack mount box on our network that has been programmed with someone else's ideas of what constitutes anomalous behavior, and that is ex- that is extremely effective, as long as the bad guys are so polite as to. Rest- you know, to to only stick to the attacks that the anomaly box knows about. Mm-hmm. Right, play within the rules, right? And right. we're also adding complexity by doing that, um, which is exactly the wrong direction to go. You know, and, and then another thing that I run into an awful lot is, is you know, it, I trace all of these problems back to the fact that we have massively uncontrolled runtime. You know, people people are able to run whatever they want on the computers. Well, it's a corporate resource that the company gave you to do some kind of a thing, and you ought to be able to you ought to be able to map that. So that's actually one of the things that we did in that in that reinventing security project was we broke everybody out into zones, and then we actually came up with. V- various application loadouts that you would see on a per zone basis. So if the developers tend to run this list of 600 different pieces of software, um, that's fine. Um, If the CTO suddenly starts running a low-level disk formatter, that's not so fine. Um, You know, and it's it's not that difficult to, to... to build this kind of information, it's it's just a matter of hard work, and that's what the CTO's job is to make sure happens. You know, another thing that comes up a lot when we talk about controlling runtime, I'm a big fan. You, I'm sure you know, I'm a big fan of application whitelisting. You should only run things that you've decided you want to run. This idea of just letting any old thing run on your desktop is utterly stupid. That's why we have so much malware. And then I say that to some CTOs and they go, yeah, but whitelisting is hard. And I actually have it right here. Usually what I do when they say that is I go, iPhone. Mm-hmm. Yeah. <laughs> with, with my best, like, stupid duh look. Right? <clears throat> iPhone, and they go, what? Say, Apple shipped six million whitelisted devices in a day. Surely it's not that hard because th- <laughs> Apple's not Apple's not that good. <laughs> no, I, I like that analogy, Marcus. Um, your uh, projects outside of uh, computer security uh, are always uh, of interest to myself and, and our listeners. Um, your, hey, hey, Paul. Be, be, yes. And before you do that, I had a, a quick one. Go ahead, Larry. I, I had one one quick one as well. Go so ahead, Joff. Go ahead, Joff. Mine is not serious. So uh, my question, uh, without uh, without hopefully without taking too long, is um, if if people do it right, uh, Marcus, if they listen to people like you and me and go, <laughs> "Yep, we're going to design this from the ground up. We're going to have software driven." <clears throat> You know, segmentation. We're going to do application whitelisting. We're going to use all of this, all those controls and ACLs to actually act as canaries in the coal mine, and we're going to do this right. What happens in you know three to five years as the environment grows and changes? How do we manage as a community with the with these people? How do we advise and consult with them with respect to environmental degradation? Right. Well, I can tell you that that's, you know, it's it's good because this this conversation is becoming like the worm Ouroboros that eats its tail as it goes. You know, it, it comes back to your metrics program. The way that you're able to keep these changes in place is by showing that they actually work. So at this media giant that I was talking about, you know, you can actually go back and say in the last year since we put these controls in place on a business unit by business unit basis. For this business unit, we were able to go from N incidents to zero. For this business unit, N incidents to zero. From this business unit, N incidents to two. For this business unit, it stayed the same. Um, Oh, by the way, that was the business unit that insisted that they didn't want to exist under our doctrines of controls, so we put them in their own separate uh, enclave and observed what happened in that enclave and here, here's here's all the pus and dis- disgusting stuff that we found in that enclave that we don't find in 
the CEO's office network that we don't find in the, the data center that we don't find in any of these because we've actually got metrics to show that these techniques work. And that's that's how you win this. And by the way, to anyone who here who's 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 listening, who's thinking, wow, I want to think about doing some of this crazy stuff Marcus is talking about, bring a small number of your desktops under configuration management. Doesn't have to be a large number. Some reasonable percentage. Put them under full configuration management. Track variances. Use application controls like App Locker so that people can't run every executable that they want. And then measure security outcomes on that group of systems differentially from the rest of your network. And at the end of the year when you go back to the CTO and the CEO and say, we did this test of 100 machines that we ran under full CM, and amazingly, we had absolutely no incidents. And all the other machines, we had 175 breaches enterprise-wide. And Very nice. Oh, and then... And then the way you hammer this, the, the final nail into that coffin is you say, oh, by the way, the breaches cost us a total of blank hours to fix. Well, so another way to answer the question is you're saying is if the metrics start diverging away from what they were in the prior measurement period, um, then you might have an indicator of environmental degradation and you can dig into it and find out what's going on. That's right. And that's that's one of the, the important things. Your metrics, you want to track outcomes. You, you track your inputs, you track your outputs, and you want to be very careful about how you bucket things. You're going to want to slice things in a variety of different ways. You slice it by root cause analysis. You slice it by business unit. You slice it by observable practices, if there's something like that. I mean, by observable practices, I mean, is it under configuration management? Is it not? Is it running application whitelisting, or is it running McAfee antivirus? I'm just going to pick on him because he's not here, um, you know. You know, you. So basically, what I'm really talking about is approaching this problem like an epidemiological study, where you can actually say, you know, this is a really bad idea. I have to tell you one of my one of my my big fail stories about this. I can't I can't name any names, but we we had a bunch of metrics from 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 one organization did a bunch of crunching on it, and it turned out that there was one department that was that was head and shoulders worse than anybody other and anybody else and and you're probably thinking yeah it's the sales guys which is of course what i thought it wasn't the sales guys at all it was human resources yeah. so we so we went to the human resources guys and said what, what 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 why are you guys so stupid and they said why we you make us open every attachment we get resumes <laughs> yeah and so then and, and so then we were able to go back to where right, so then what you what you find is you found that um, that over fifty percent of the security incidents in this particular organization came from human resources. So let's pretend for hypo hypothetical. There's two hundred incidents per year. A hundred of them were in HR, and and of that hundred, three of all of them came from three desktops that just kept getting owned over and over again. So of course you know you go to management. Yeah, so you go to management and you say, we'd like to buy three extremely locked down desktops that are going to be the ones that the HR people are going to are going to read all of the attachments and stuff like that on. Uh, for a total cost of $5,000, we're going to be able to have our projected number of incidents next year. And of course, the first thing management says is, is why didn't you come to us with this two, three years ago? Yeah. Why? Uh, so, Marcus, uh, I want to make sure we get to the SOAP. Yep. I, okay. I, actually, our, our mutual friend, uh, Catherine at Misty, said, Marcus is sending me something in the mail, and I'm really scared. <laughs> and I'm like, you, know, you kind of you should be. And then she called me back like, a couple days later, and she's like, it, it was soap. I'm like, soap? She's like, yeah, he's making soap. I'm like, that's awesome. Yeah, I sent her a soap Mozart. That's awesome. So I got into I, I got into um, soap making because my ex girlfriend got me into trying to do some perfuming to try to reverse engineer some perfume that has gone off the market and then I wound up with all these scents and I started thinking what are some other things that I can do with scents and then I I gotten into doing mold making and stuff like that and so I thought well oh scent plus mold soap right so I started doing some soap making um, and I've got a friend uh, Scott Conti who used to work IT for uh, for university who's got a CNC machine and so I have Scott make stuff with a CNC machine and then I make silicone molds from that or I make molds from found objects or life castings I don't know if it's going to show on the TV but I brought uh, this is my um, uh, it's not very visible uh, let's see cool. 
It, oh, it's my yes. Bates it's Motel. My, yes. Yes. My, Bates Motel <laughs> my Bates Motel guest soap. And I made a version of this. That's I brilliant. made a version of this that was filled with a red gel interior. So you, <laughs> shower, you shower for a little while and then it would start to look absolutely horrible. But <laughs> if, you'll, if you'll indulge me for a second, I actually made a mold the other day, which I haven't demolded, but I poured uh, soap last night. And so it's been curing. And. <laughs> Uh, well, you know this story that Don, John Dillinger uh, got out of prison by making carving a gun out of soap is what gave me the idea, and I hate those bastards in the National Rifle Association. So I thought I would do something, and I made a soap Beretta, which we have right oh, here. Very nice, oh very oh, nice. Look at that. <laughs> Uh, yeah. See, and that's way better than the dongs I thought you were going to be doing. <laughs> yeah. And it's, actually, it's actually, actually, you can't do dongs for various reasons. It's actually lemon balm scent. It's very nice. It's Ooh. sudsy. It's, it's delicious. Yeah. Um, so why can't you do dongs? The reason you can't do dongs is because for the soap to cure, moisture has to transpire out of the mold. So you need to have something that's that's kind of uh, half. I, I do have life castings of female genitalia that have come out fairly well. You can see them off on my website if you search for random soap. Uh, they're actually quite they're actually quite lovely if you put a little pink uh, coloring in them. They look amazingly lifelike. Nice. Um, I love this guy. <laughs> You can hop in the shower and rub it all over yourself. I would do, I would do, I would do, guys. Except the problem is that that there's a relatively small area for the moisture to transpire out of. It's also fairly difficult to make a mold of, of the male anatomy. It it's a little bit more difficult mechanically. Yes, it changes. I, think, I, I, I was going to say, if if it was the problem of moisture, you could probably just find someone that wasn't nearly. See, as I think the fact that you have doubt. female and not male is very sexist, Marcus. Well, <laughs> I have. Let me put it this way: I have tried. The reasons <laughs> I wasn't able to do it was 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 purely technical. If it, if you if you'd like to understand a little bit about what I'm talking about, it's fairly easy for a woman to lie on her back with her with her legs up while you build a square box around her and pour alginate in. It's a lot harder for you to stand with a um, PVC pipe with a cap. Around <laughs> genitalia, and then you've got a hole cut in the top, and you have to pour the alginate in there and remain excited the entire time. <laughs> Challenge accepted. Challenge accepted. That is <laughs> a very technical <laughs> explanation. Next, next week on Security Weekly. That's right. <laughs> Tune in next week. Have, having just previewed, they're amazingly lifelike. Uh, yeah. <laughs> well, Marcus. Wow. Thank you very much for coming on Security Weekly. <laughs> Uh, it was wonderful having you as always, and uh, I hope to see you soon at a at a conference. And uh, again, thanks for coming on the show. Sure, always a pleasure. Thanks, Marcus. Thanks, Marcus.